Shalom everybody, James Trim here. <clears throat> and this uh, video was actually uh, idea requests, okay? So uh, let us know in the comments, by the way, if you have uh, uh, topics that you'd like me to address in future videos. Yeah, sometimes it takes me a while to get to the video that you, uh, when I take a request, because I have, I'm backed up with material and um, it's, uh, uh, it takes some, some time sometimes to get caught up with what I've already got in backlog. And sometimes I have things already filmed, if you will, ready to go. But somebody asked for me to do a video that would discuss and explain and give documentation on how the new moon was um, calculated, if you will, how the new moon was uh, reckoned. Uh, during, uh, and they wanted mission of references and whatnot, uh, in the pre Hillel 2 calendar. <clears throat> so, um, uh, that's, that's what we'll be talking about today with full documentation. Um, as usual, before we get started, please donate to support these videos. You can click on the donate link in the video description down below. Uh, or you can send uh, uh, donations to uh, donations at wnae.org via PayPal uh, to donations at wnae.org. Also, please like our videos. Please subscribe to this video. Let us know what you think about our videos in the comments. Share these videos with your friends. All of these things help us out. These videos are brought to you by you. So uh, we need your help to continue producing them. All right. So as usual, we have handouts for this video. And um, when I produced the, the handouts for this video, then I thought of something else that I needed to, that I should document. And so there's actually two sets of handouts for this video, and you'll find both of them in the video description. The second handout is just one page. It's just one additional thing I wanted to cover. So the first thing I want to cover here is that the, the uh, and we'll show this multiple ways, that the new moon to the uh, ancient Hebrews was in fact the first appearance of the crescent over Jerusalem. Uh, it wasn't an invisible dark new moon. Uh, it wasn't a calculated new moon like the Hillel 2 calendar actually uses, but the Hillel 2 calendar actually very closely predicts the Hebrew calendar that we use today is the Hillel 2 calendar. In the fourth century, the Rome's uh, shut down the Sanhedrin by law. And uh, up to that time, as we will demonstrate, the Sanhedrin uh, determined the new moon. And they did this like the Torah tells us to determine something uh, by the testimony of at least two witnesses. So they would uh, um, uh, inquire of witnesses. Witnesses would appear before the Sanhedrin. Yes, I saw the, the crescent. And they would establish that the crescent had been seen. And that would be the, uh, the new moon. Obviously, that had to be something that could be seen visually. And therefore, it wasn't an invisible dark new moon. Um, and... Uh, it, Hillel II calculated invisible dark new moons with a mathematical process that was very, very good at doing that. But it was easier to calculate dark, invisible dark new moons, much easier than trying to calculate the first appearance of a crescent uh, over Jerusalem. Okay, so let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. This is our first clue. So 1 Samuel chapter 20, uh, verses 18 through 34. This tells us the uh, story of King David, uh, who was not yet king, uh, coming to 
a feast that is being uh, thrown, if you will, a new moon feast that's being thrown by Saul. Verse 18, then Jonathan said to Saul, tomorrow is the new moon and you shall, uh, and you shall be missed because they, your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, then you shall go down quickly and come to the place where you did hide yourself when the business was in hand and shall remain by the stone Ezel. And I will shoot three arrows on the side thereof, so uh, though I shot at a mark, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say unto you, to the lad, behold, the arrows are on this side of you, take them, then come you, for there is peace in, in you and no hurt as the Lord lives. So in other words, this is a signal as to whether it's safe for him. But if I say to the young man, behold, the arrows are beyond you, go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. And as touching the matter, which you and I have spoken of, behold, the Lord be between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat down to eat meat. And the king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spoke not anything uh, that day, for he thought something has befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. So he's thinking, ah, maybe he was unclean. And since he was ritually unclean, he couldn't come. <clears throat> and it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, wherefore comes not the son of Jesse to meet neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked, leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, let me go, I pray you, for my family has sacrificed in the city and my brother, he has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, let me go away, I pray you, and see my brothers. Therefore, he comes not unto the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that, what, that you have chosen the son of Jesse uh, to your own confusion and onto the confusion of your mother's na uh, nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lived upon the ground, lives up upon the ground, you shall not uh, be established, nor your kingdom. Therefore, now send and fetch him for me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Wherefore shall he be slain? In other words, why would you kill him? What has he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereof Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did not eat meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Now, why are we reading this story? Well, in verses 27 and 34, we see this phrase, the second day of the month, um, which is in the Hebrew, Hachadesh Hashani. There is some debate as to what the meaning of this phrase is. The Septuagint translates it to mean on the second day of the month in verse 27 and on the uh, um, and uh, uh, this is not the normal Hebrew structure for that phrase. It's bad Hebrew grammar. Um, because the modifier second would be before the word month. The Aramaic Peshitta renders the phrase in verse 27. Uh, the Peshitta is a literal Aramaic translation of the Bible. So the Aramaic Peshitta renders the phrase in verse 27 as, and it, sh it came to pass on the other day, 
of the new moon. And in verse 34, as the second day of the new moon. This understanding that we see in the Peshitta agrees with what the uh, first century Jewish writer Josephus, uh, who refers to the second day in his account of these events as, but on the next day, which was the new moon, in antiquity 6, 11, 9. So why was the new moon banquet being held on two consecutive days? The reason is that the new moon was not a calculated invisible dark new moon, but was determined by observation. They couldn't determine in advance, you're trying to set the date for a party, okay? They couldn't determine in advance when the new moon crescent would be visible. And so the banquet, which had to be scheduled in advance, was being scheduled for two days. Okay, let's turn to our next handout, the testimony of Philo of Alexandria, who was a first century Jewish writer who lived in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and he gives a very specific explanation of the new moon as it was understood in the first century. He writes in Special Laws, uh, second book, uh, 140 through 141, he says, following the order which we have adopted, we proceed to speak of the third festival, that of the new moon. First of all, because it is the beginning of the month and the beginning, whether of number or of time, is honorable. Secondly, because at this time there is nothing in the whole of heaven destitute of light. Thirdly, because at that period the more powerful and important body gives a portion of necessary assistance to the less important and weaker body. For at that time of the new moon, the sun begins to eliminate the moon with a light which is visible to the outward senses. And then she displays her own beauty to the beholders. And this is, as it seems, an evident lesson of kindness and humanity to men to teach them that they should never grudge to impart their own good things to others but imitating the heavenly bodies should draw uh, should drive envy away and banish it from the soul so notice that philo says of the times of the new moon he calls it the time there is nothing in the whole of heaven destitute of light. And then he says, at the time of the new moon, the sun begins to eliminate the moon with a light which is visible to the outward senses. This eliminates any doubt whatsoever. Philo didn't recognize the invisible dark new moon as Rosh Chodesh, as the new moon. He didn't, um, he recognized a first appearance of a crescent. He also uh, didn't recognize a, um, uh, a new moon or a new month that was completely Qumran, uh, well, I don't think, that was, uh, according to the so-called solar calendar, he didn't recognize a solar new moon that was divorced from the actual phases of the moon. Um, he did not recognize a full moon as a new moon, as some one bizarre version goes around, which is, directly contradictory to what Philo says here. So Philo very specifically describes the first appearance of uh, the sun's light on the, new, on the new crescent moon as it's first appearing as the new moon. All right, now let's look at the testimony of the Mishnah. The Mishnah discusses the sighting of the new moon in tractate Rosh Hashanah. Uh, because Tractate Rosh Hashanah deals with um, the new moon is very important because for Rosh Hashanah, uh, the uh, Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets, uh, Yom Teruah, it's, the, uh, it's a feast that actually occurs on the first day of the month. So if you're going to know when that feast day is going to be, which is kind of important because uh, you're not allowed to work on that day, uh, then you have to know 
when the new moon is. And so um, the, uh, the Mishnah, Rosh Hashanah, uh, chapter 1, paragraph 3, or Mishnah 3 through chapter 3, Mishnah 1, describes in detail the testimony that the witnesses would give the Sanhedrin uh, as to the appearance of the new moon. So this portion of the Mishnah discusses when messengers would be sent to the diaspora, to the, uh, uh, to the rest of the world, to notify them of the sighting of the new moon, uh, one in Mishnah 1.3, in uh, Rosh Hashanah 1.3. Uh, it describes when the Sabbath is loosed for the witnesses to testify in chapter 1.4. Uh, it questions as to how clearly the new moon appeared in uh, uh, chapter 1, uh, Mishnah 5. Whether a father and son could both serve as witnesses uh, in chapter 1, verse uh, Mishnah 7. Uh, who could serve as a valid witness in chapter 1, Mishnah 8. What to do with a witness that was unable to walk. Um, in chapter 1, Mishnah 9. A system of flare signals that were once sent to send the signal of the sighting to the diaspora in uh, chapter 2, Mishnahs 1 through 4. If you've seen the Lord of the Rings where they were lighting the fires on the mountains and they would light a fire that could be seen from a mountaintop in the far distance. And that mountaintop, they would light a fire at the top of that mountain summit. They could be seen from another mountain in the far distance and so on until the, the signal was passed to uh, the far place. So um, uh, this also gives uh, in the Mishnah here where the witnesses would be gathered in chapter 2, Mishnah 5 how the witnesses were to be questioned in Mishnah, in, chapter, uh, in uh, Rosh Hashanah chapter 2, verse uh, Mishnah 6, and how they were shown a chart of moon phases for comparison. So when the witnesses were being questioned, according to Mish, uh, Rosh Hashanah chapter 2, Mishnah 8, they would show them a chart of moon phases to, uh, for comparison to, for their testimony. All of this makes it absolutely clear that the witnesses were seeing the new moon and giving testimony of what they saw to the Sanhedrin, which would then officially designate the day of the new moon. Of particular interest are two passages here uh, in this portion that discuss the orientation of the moon. Mishnah Rosh Hashanah chapter 2, Mishnah 6. How do they test the witnesses? I think this is getting to what my, uh, what the uh, requester, the person who requested this video is wanting. How do they test the witnesses? The pair who arrive first are tested first. The senior of them is brought in and they say to him, tell us how you saw the moon in front of the sun or behind the sun, to the north of it or to the south. How big was it? And in which direction was it inclined? And how broad was it? He says, if he says he saw it in front of the sun, his evidence is rejected. After that, they would bring in the second and test him. If their account tallied, their evidence was accepted. And the other pairs were only questioned briefly, not because they were required at all, but because they should not be disappointed and so that they would not they would be dissuaded from coming to testify in the future. The second speaks of a chart showing moon phases that the witnesses were shown for comparison. But the one we just looked at, by the way, notice that it's, they asked him, was it facing this way or that way? An invisible dark new moon can't be witnessed and it can't face a uh, given direction. And sorry to the full moon people, a full moon uh, unlike a crescent, is just an orb. It can't, uh, uh, unless you actually are talking about the features of the moon, it's, uh, 
not really something that faces a given direction. Um, I mean, it, it can if you go down to, uh, uh, sorry to the flat earth people, but if you go to the southern hemisphere, the moon will be flipped upside down from its appearance in the northern hemisphere, um, which is only possible with a, uh, a, a nice spherical earth. But um, that, uh, uh, so there, there is that. Okay, so the next example is in Rosh Hashanah, uh, Mishnah Rosh Hashanah, chapter 2, uh, Mishnah 8. It says, Rabbi Gamaliel had diagrams of the shapes of the moon on a tablet and on the wall of the upper chamber. These he used to show the ordinary people asking, did you see the moon like this or like that? It once happened that two came and said, we saw it in the east in the morning and on the west in the evening. Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri said they are false witnesses. But when they arrived in Yavne, Rabbi Gamaliel accepted them. And on another occasion, who came and said, we saw it in its proper time, but, one of the, uh, but on the following night, and we did not see it. Rabbi Gamaliel accepted them. Rabbi Dose ben Hirkanis said, uh, they are false witnesses. And Rabbi Yehoshua ben Kaniah replied, I agree with you. Okay, so the point here is these passages make it very clear. It had a shape. The moon, the new moon had a shape. It has to be a crescent. An invisible dark new moon doesn't have a crescent. Um, and a spherical moon doesn't have a, a spherical dark new moon doesn't have a shape. And a spherical moon, it's spherical, but it, uh, uh, that's all there is to it. So there's no question of shape to be uh, debated. And of course, if you're using a solar calendar, there is also no shape. Uh, the next handout says the reestablished Sanhedrin. I, I thought it was important to note that there has been a reestablishment of the rabbinic Sanhedrin, or at least an effort to do so in, is, in modern Israel today. And uh, the information is here for you. But basically, um, this is what the, the, uh, the reestablished Sanhedrin in Israel says. A special court has been established to accept evidence concerning sightings of the new moon as required by the Jewish law. This court is made up of various justices who are assembled to hear evidence as, their, as the opportunity permits. The purpose of the court is to increase awareness, develop skills, and resolve halakhic issues that arise when determining the Jewish calendar according to the testimony of witnesses. At this point, there is no intention to supersede the mathematical calendar currently in use and fix the calendar on the basis of the testimony. Such a, a step should be unacceptable to the public and spiritual leadership. Nevertheless, witnesses appear before the court and are investigated with precision according to what they saw. Sometimes the witnesses may also bring photographic evidence to support their testimony. Evidence is already being collected by the Yerush HaShomayim volunteers, the, uh, witness, the uh, new moon guardians, basically, uh, the moon guardians or the moon watchers, uh, throughout the land of Israel with the intention that testimony can be presented before the court in a full legal fashion with the people, uh, when the people's hearts are ready for it. Um, and there's the link where you can actually find that at the Rabbinic Sanhedrin website. So the position of the modern Rabbinic Sanhedrin is, yeah, this is the way it should be done, uh, but the hearts of the people aren't ready to shift and start doing it this way yet. Nonetheless, we're going through the motions and we're interviewing the witnesses of the new moon and uh, um, the day will come that uh, the rabbinic Sanhedrin will declare new moons based on witnesses testimony and not the mathematical pattern. Now I'll turn to our second handout and it just covers one thing briefly I, I wanted to cover and that is for those that try and argue that Rosh Chodesh isn't new moon. Uh, this is especially common with the solar calendar people that want to reject biblical Hebrew and insist that Rosh Chodesh isn't a new moon. 
And we have absolute evidence that it is in the wisdom of Ben Sirah, chapter 43, verses 6 through 8, in the Hebrew copies that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's no question this is biblical Hebrew. You don't have to accept the wisdom of Ben Sirah as uh, canonical. Uh, uh, if you do, that's great. But if you don't, that's great too. You don't have to. Because the point here is that we have uh, a witness in Second Temple era Hebrew. Uh, and a Second Temple era text in Hebrew that tells us how the Hebrew word was used. It doesn't matter if it was canon or not. It's how it was used. And so verse 6 says, in chapter 43, verse 6, And even the shining moon wanes according to its time, though it is for ruling the seasons and an everlasting sign. Verse 7, By it are the seasons and the times of the statute, and shining it vanishes in its circuit. Verse 8, the new moon, and the Hebrew is Rosh Chodesh, according to its name, renews itself. And Rosh Chodesh, Rosh means head, Chodesh means something that's renewed. According to its name, renews itself. How wonderful is it when it changes? The beacon of the host wanes on high, leaving the firmament aglow from its shining. There's absolutely no question here that Rosh Chodesh means new moon, and it refers to the uh, new moon crescent. Okay, so one more time, I just need to encourage everybody to please donate to support these video teachings. Um, let us know what you like, uh, what you think in the comments. If you have questions, if you have uh, uh, some subject you'd like to, to cover in the future, it won't be immediately, but it, I'll put it on the list. Uh, please let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like these videos. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to these videos so you'll know when new videos come out and help us boost our subscriber numbers. We are trying to reach 3,000. Donate to support these videos, please. Uh, the uh, This video will probably be coming out around the time our rent is either due or must clear. And right now, at the time of making this video, we don't have it. So um, please donate by clicking on the donate link in the video description or by sending donations to uh by PayPal to donations at WNAE.org. And uh, of course, share these videos with your friends on social media. All right, shalom everybody, until next time.